Welcome to New Ways, New Habits podcast, hosted by change behaviour experts T3 and Kidian Partners. And if you don't know who we are, we offer leadership and behavioural change products and services to multinational companies, large public sector organisations and SMEs within the UK and globally. Hello everyone and welcome back to the second in the two-part podcast. I'm Lauren Newton. And I'm Charlotte Boschblad. Last time we took you through some insights that we've gained from our Future of Leadership research project. We spoke about the challenges facing businesses and leaders and what this means at a high level for leaders moving forward. We shared our three pillars of our leadership behaviours, purpose, agility and people, and took you through the purpose, pillar and what this means. Today, we're going to continue the conversation and take you through agility and people. To do this, we'll relate back to some of the challenges we shared last time to elaborate on why each of these pillars is important and then what it looks like at the leadership level. So let's start with agility. Why do leaders need to be particularly agile at the moment? A common theme that was raised in our research project was the pace of change we're now experiencing. Uh, COVID has helped us leapfrog some of the old resistance that many organisations were facing to moving away from how things are done here around here um, and help businesses realise that they could change and adapt more quickly than ever before because quite simply they had to. And now change is all around us and continuing as we've adjusted into this new way of working. Um, And where we work is changing because companies are grappling with what the offices of the future look like and whether employees are hybrid, office-based or remote workers. Some businesses have recently mandated the return to the office and as a result are likely to lose critical top talent. Um, And why is that? It's because a recent survey has showed that 98% of people want to work remotely at least some of the time nowadays. And as a result of much more of our work being virtual and of new technologies, the way we work together and the way that we collaborate is changing as well. 95% of UK executives recently agreed that leveraging AI agent ecosystems will be a significant opportunity for their organisations in the next three years. So that will mean embedding this technology within their organisations and having foresight to see how shifting regulation will impact its use as well. So lots and lots of change. What people want is also changing. This is both employees and consumers. And we already mentioned in our last podcast that the Cone Porter Novelli survey found that 91% of consumers would switch to a new product from a purpose-driven company. It is therefore unsurprising that in 2023, BCG found that 40% increase in stock price for change resilient organisations. And a recent study demonstrated that the top 10% of financial performers are the 30% more agile than the rest. So it's clear that businesses need to lead the change and bring people with them. So what challenges do leaders face in leading this change? One of the things I hear a lot when working with clients is around leaders needing to make decisions more quickly and under increasing uncertainty Um, and often where they don't have experience or toolkit to rely on. So they've never experienced it before, but they've got to do it now. Um, And and it's really difficult for them to do so because they just don't have sort of role models that face the same challenges. Yeah, exactly. And some of the leaders I interviewed in in the research project talked about needing to lead people with greater skills or knowledge than them as well, or areas that they're unfamiliar with, like tech. And so flatter matrix structures are becoming more common and triggering leaders to also lead broader functions. So it's harder to make decisions with conviction um, and evaluate other people's performance when you know less about what they're doing ultimately. And there's also the challenge around innovation and needing to keep up with sort of the startups and those tech advances, particularly for those large organisations that we work so much with. It's really hard for them when they're established and they've got ways of working, but they need to be able to quickly pivot and do something different. An example from this was our attentions work, um, and we looked at Fevertree and how they've been able to adapt much quicker than some of their larger, more established competitors, which has enabled them to be a little bit more successful in the marketplace. 
And one of the businesses we really want to put a spotlight on here about demonstrating agility, leveraging technology and taking a few risks is Amazon. Obviously, that very well-known retailer, who I'm, I'm sure we all know, um, started in 1994 as an online book retailer. And whilst others were doing this, they were a little bit different because they went that extra mile and delivered to your door. They then expanded in 1998 to offer other services, music, computer games, um, and then quickly went on to offer much more in terms of household products, amongst other things, as well as web services. So actually breaking into some of the technology services there as well. In 2007, they really changed the way in which we interact and consume books, bringing out the Kindle. Um, and alongside this um, and, and thinking about what it sells and diversifying that, Amazon has really leveraged advances in technology, um, be this AI, drones and robots to fulfill orders. I mean, it hasn't always worked for them. There's obviously the, the, the case study most people are aware of where the AI and their recruitment tool turned out to be a little bit biased. But by adapting and leveraging tech and taking the risks alongside their consumer first approach, it's really enabled them to become the one stop shop we know it's today. And, of course, hugely successful in the process. And in 2018, Amazon reached the new heights of becoming the second ever company to reach one trillion dollar market cap. So all of this in terms of change and, and needing to change and, and how people have been more successful by changing and adapting. How can leaders in organisations demonstrate agility? Well, one way we found they can do that is by making decisions in ambiguous situations and, and having courage to empower other people. So they may need to be comfortable operating in ambiguity outside of their comfort zone, letting go of needing to feel in control or being the pinnacle of expertise that they may have been earlier on in their careers. They, they need to be very self-aware of their knowledge and their experience gaps um, and be keen to learn and con continually seek out new knowledge. And one interviewee I, I spoke to summed this up really nicely recently. They said, the moment a leader thinks that they know it all, they need to go and get their pension. I think that nicely sums up a, a frame of mind of continually being open to, to new ideas and new ways of working and new learnings. And for leaders to perhaps balance their knowledge gaps or areas that they, they don't know so well, they need to know who is the best person to bring in to make a decision where they, might not, where they not be, may not be the best themselves. So who has the knowledge, um, who has the skill and who can cover, cover their own gaps. Leaders need to be willing to make bolder decisions with less certainty um, and to ensure they don't regret their decisions. They need to be strategic and therefore aware of trends and the likely impact that their decision has on their organisation. So what this means is being intellectually capable to make connections between concepts they may not fully understand and very long term thinking. And finally, they need a drive to promote and and move forward continuous change and improvement in their business and creating safety for other people to experiment and disrupt the way that things are done. It's just a short list of requirements for leaders. And it is really interesting, isn't it? Because all of this change that they're then managing, leading and 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 experiencing themselves is also impacting the people they lead, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. And, it, and it's, I mean, it's a really nice bridge there to our last pillar um, in our model, people. Um, and with people, it's really not surprising, um, given everything we've just said and, and what we said um, on, our, on our last podcast as well, that 45% of HR leaders are saying that their employees are change fatigue. I was only a few weeks ago, a leader in a multinational FMCG asked me, when is the change going to stop or at least slow down? Um, they didn't really appreciate my response to that, I'd say. <laughs> they, were, they were hoping it was going to be more positive than it was. Um, and all this change is impacting on employee attrition, with less than 50% of people who are feeling change fatigued wanting to stay at their organisation. And, and change fatigue isn't the only people-related challenge that, that leaders are facing at the moment, is it? No, there are so many people-related challenges, and let's highlight a few now. So I would say the first one is this huge competition for talent. 
that we hear time and time again. And um, 50% of HR leaders in a recent Gartner um, study did say they expect an increase in competition um, in talent over the next six months. I think we're probably all hoping that that might change, but but sadly, it still seems that that trend is with us and, it, and it's, it's likely to, to get a little bit worse and a little bit more tough there in terms of the conditions for getting the best talent in the marketplace. And also, you know, as we mentioned previously, um, about the changes in, in generations coming into the workforce. So we've got, you know, by 2025, Gen Z will make up a quarter of the global workforce. And as we've said, their drivers are so different to others in the workforce. They are more ethics and values based. They deeply care about societal issues and they really do want to work for a purpose led organisation, um, ensuring that their work is, is meaningful to them. Doing all of this with better work life balance. Um, so it's very different to, to maybe some of the other generations that we do have in the workplace and particularly the generations leading them um, in the workplace too. And of course, this loops us all back to sort of our purpose pillar in the first place of making sure that purpose is really meaningful for those individuals in the workplace. So it's going to be harder to attract candidates into roles or increase skills gaps. Um, and that's mostly due to the pace of change and uptakes in technology. And many organisations are therefore going to need to promote and develop people within their organisation. Yeah, so having the right talent in the right places is going to be be an ongoing challenge, um, as is in engaging and helping them work better together. So we know that hybrid or virtual working has led to lagging collaboration and sharing of information in organizations recently. Um, we've got an increase in siloed working and some organizations we're speaking to at the moment highlighting increased conflict as well. I think some of this is that working virtually affords us less opportunity to create trust. There's less informal communication going on and kind of gossip that would happen if people are face to face or passing each other in the corridor. Um, and it's also harder to develop people or monitor their performance in a more virtual, um, highly demanding environment. And so it's not a surprise that many organisations are facing well-being and engagement issues at the moment, uh, driven by these issues we've just been mentioning, um, but also strongly by stress fatigue and technology fatigue since COVID. Um, a recent Gallup study found that 59% of people are quietly quitting which is huge. So I saw it said there's, I mean, there's a huge come out going on there, isn't there, in terms of people and the complexity. Um, and what we found and, and our research has showed, you know, for leaders to be supporting with this, helping to overcome these challenges, they really need to be leading more inclusively than ever before. And also with with so much more emotional intelligence. And I'm, I'm hearing that so much from clients of how can we measure people's emotional intelligence? We need our leaders to be much more tuned in to people within the organisation in order to manage them effectively. And we know that businesses led by inclusive leaders are 45% more likely to grow in market share. They're 81% better productivity um, and engagement and loyalty within their organisation. And also, really importantly, um, there's 79% improved collaboration within those teams and organisations where they are led by inclusive leaders. Exactly. And so the big question is, what does a highly emotionally intelligent, inclusive leader look like? Let's look at it from two different angles. So firstly, at an individual level, uh, a person level, it's being self-aware of how their perspectives differ to others and being highly curious to build their awareness of others' perspectives, experiences, thoughts, emotions. It's about being empathetic and being able to pick up on how others are feeling um, and responding with genuine care and support. It's not enough just to ask an open question. It's responding in the right way and showing that you're hearing and listening and care and equally sharing vulnerability back to build trust and, and, and be authentic in the way that, that you're communicating. It's about building trust and depth of connection with other people, operating openly and consistently. And it's about being willing to flex and adapt your style. 
um, and, and leaders being able to motivate people in different ways by pulling people in and, and interacting or motivating them in different ways. And then in how they lead teams across the organisation, it's about helping individuals collaborate more and promoting a one business view rather than siloed views or competing views within different teams or functions within organisations. It's creating highly capable teams through development support and also promoting really diverse talent pools um, around the business. And it's also hugely importantly, proactively enabling others and trusting them to do. So being humble and bringing other people into decision making when you're not the best person to do it, but then knowing who within your organisation is the best person to do it and who should be making those decisions. is making sure people are really clear on what they need to be delivering and why they need to be delivering it. And of course, making sure the resource is available to enable them to do that too. Um, with this, it is about giving that empowerment and that accountability to others whilst being there to catch them when they need you and giving them support when they need you. I think a nice way of, of summing up the, the kind of undertone of inclusive leadership as well is that being an inclusive leader is not a tick box exercise. It's an evolving journey for leaders and it requires proactive effort and reflection and continually striving to learn more about other people and bringing more people into the conversation. So to draw this podcast to a close, um, we know that leading well in this current and future context is complex and it is challenging. Um, What we would like you to do now is just to reflect on how you would rate your current leaders in terms of their ability to firstly create and drive forward purpose in your business. Second, to lead with agility, uh, making change and positive growth happen, even in ambiguous situations. And third, build trust and deep connections with other people, bringing them together and having a truly motivated and engaged workforce. Well, certainly lots to think about there. Um, Thank you all for listening. We really hope you found this insightful and do not hesitate to get in touch if you want to hear more from us. So thank you for listening to our podcast, New Ways, New Habits. To find out future release dates, follow us on LinkedIn and you can find all future podcasts on Spotify, SoundCloud and Apple. We really are the whole package. And it wouldn't be right without saying, don't forget to provoke, plant and practice these new ways and new habits.